All right, uh, welcome back. I, as f I understand we're live again. Uh, I'm still Drifting Skies. I will be continuing hosting through this uh, next game. Uh, Baldur's Gate, we're going to be starting here in just a couple minutes. Uh, just as a reminder, this is RPG Limit Break 2017, uh, held in Salt Lake City here in May 2017. May is ma Mental Health Month. And it, as such, it is fitting that we are here supporting NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. NAMI works to increase the availability of mental health care, promote early identification, intervention, and support mental health caregivers. If you wish to know more, head to NAMI.org, N-A-M-I, or reach out to NAMI on, on Twitter with, ha with the at sign NAMI Communicate. Um. So uh, we've got... Uh, Main character name for Baldur's Gate 2, that donation has been closed, and that's Purple Ladyface uh, by a pretty substantial $1,853 margin over uh, the next uh, highest bid. So, pretty decisive victory on that bid war. Yes, capital P, capital L, capital F. That's correct. We're waiting on getting the timer back again. seen this game <laughs> so I don't know this seems to be a trend during this marathon that's right it's all about the moral support <laughs> but your lawful evil oh yeah what does that even oh no 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 I see it's do you like... want the explanation I'm happy to tell you while they're sorting things out with the timer it... actually yeah, I should probably ahead. say a couple things about the character too since we're here and we've got a little time um, we are lawful evil specifically because your alignment determines what abilities your familiar has. Every uh, spellcaster as a main character can summon a familiar to travel around with you. And uh, lawful evil familiars gain the ability to polymorph themselves once per day, uh, which is going to be relevant about three minutes into the run. Uh, they, the, they crop the sides off. Is that okay? Uh, no, the way you had it before was actually better. Okay, so you can polymorph? The familiar will be able to polymorph, yeah. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then you have, like, 7 strength, 18 <laughs> dexterity, yeah. 18 constitution. So in Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2 and all the Infinity Engine games, you get the ability to uh, subtract and add numbers to your stats as you like from a stat pool that you've rolled, and you can reroll as many times as you like. Uh, in this case, I have chosen to take a Wisdom of 6, which is the minimum Wisdom requirement uh, for a Witch spell. It's going to happen about 17 minutes into the run. Uh, and then the Dexterity and Constitution scores are just keep me alive. Intelligence is my spellcasting modifier, and Charisma is for 
Uh, the easiest way to get into a prison sequence is going to happen relatively early in the run. Uh, strength is almost entirely irrelevant, so it's wherever I dump the rest of my points. Cool. Wait, you talk yourself into a prison? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. and you need a high charisma for it, too, because the alternative is getting stabbed. I think, is are you all ready for the run to begin? I personally am. It looks good. All right. No. Let's walk in. Let's give it the old three, two, one. So this is Baldur's Gate 2 Enhanced Edition, and the Enhanced Edition was released in 2013 by Beamdog Studios to modernize uh, a pretty old franchise ah, for modern operating systems and to add some original content. Uh, what we actually care about for the speedrun purposes is that it allows us to stack our speed buffs together. So about halfway through the one, we're going to be picking up uh, boots of speed and combining it with haste spells and oils of speed to get four times movement rate. Oh, nice. We start off with this lovely 90 second long unskippable cutscene, but shortly thereafter we'll have to pick spells and we'll meet the first NPC that we're using, which is Imowen. And Imowen's actually you critical for two skips as we leave the dungeon. And because there are so many glitches and complicated things going on in the run, I'm going to be trying to use the time during these cutscenes to explain what's going on. As it's happening, it's going to be really fast, so it'll be hard for me to keep up. Um, the biggest skip coming up after I leave this dungeon, it's about four minutes away, maybe five, uh, is going to be the M1 skip and the multiple dialogue glitch. And they're both based on the idea that when this game checks to see if two characters are close enough together to have a conversation, it only compares two sets of coordinates. It doesn't actually check what map they're on. So by maneuvering Imowen into a position that matches the coordinates I emerge from the dungeon, I can force her to start dialogue with me even though we're not standing on the same map. Uh, and that's going to interrupt the cutscene and allow me to act naturally, and it's going to do some really wacky Come stuff on. momentarily. We have to get out of here. But first I need to grab some spells. Gotcha. Uh, I'm trying to think. It follows a little bit. This is going to sound yep. dumb. It's like a D&D &D game. It is literally a D&D &D game. It is literally a D&D &D <laughs> game. This is uh, based on the AD&D &D rule set, so we do have Thaco. We do have low armor scores being good. Um, it's a little weird if you didn't play AD&D. &D. Thankfully, uh, I did as a young nerd. And you'll see me quick saving and quick loading in between my spell casting animations. That's because the game works on an internal timer of combat rounds. The combat rounds are about six seconds long. And if you just wait and you know delay for your spells to cast naturally, uh, they will not cast until that combat round ends. And by quick saving and quick loading, we force it into a new combat round. Uh, what I just did here is the first glitch of the run. It's called the familiar skip. When I pull my familiar out of my backpack, it actually spawns under my feet and pushes me to the next valid location. And in this case, the next valid location is the opposite side of a locked door that I don't have the key for. Well. I mean, that's good. <laughs> it saves about 25 seconds here. It's going to save about eight minutes later. <laughs> so I kill this one in the front with Magic Missile, and that's because she has a lot of dialogue that I don't want to deal with right now, and she has an antidote potion that I need for the trap coming up right here. And we're done with the first floor. Well, that was pretty fast. Yeah, and we're going to drink that potion right now, too. The antidote one. Here's Yoshimo. Yoshimo's a super cool dude. We're going to use him to soak a spell effect to the face. Let's come back here, you. For a safety save in there. This room is actually the hardest pull in the speed run. And it's really dumb because anybody who played this casually knows that this is like the intro starter fight. It's not supposed to be challenging. Uh, Wait, do you have a bear? Yes, uh, that is something that I mentioned earlier when I mentioned the uh, ability to polymorph. My familiar, who's normally an imp, is now a bear. And that is because bears are awesome. Okay, that's pretty awesome. You know, I barely caught that. Just wanted to let you know. Oh, boy. We're starting early today, huh? Well, I knew yep. it was coming. I mean, I really asked for it. I literally asked for it. We've so. only got half an hour, okay? That's true. We got less than half an hour if everything goes right. So we'll see how this goes. Oh, God. Um. We, we do have a few donations when uh, there's a good opportunity. Yes. Uh, there's actually going to be a lot going on right now, but we'll get to a cutscene pretty soon. I'll let you know. All right. So I'm setting up the MON skip and the multiple dialogue that's right here. Uh, first things first, I'm actually meeting myself in the hallway. So I've got MON hanging out on this side. Main character is coming up the hallway the long way. And uh, the game checks to see if you're close enough to give items to each other, but not if there's intervening terrain. So I just chuck it through the wall. <laughs> that seems like the right way to do it. So here is the uh, first skip. This is the easier of the two, and this is a cutscene skip. 
I go here, our coordinates match. She talks to me, I can put the bear back in my backpack. And the cutscene that's supposed to play here never fires. Uh, but now I'm manipulating a little bit of the way the game stores memory to do the MO and skip. Yep. There's some RNG to this, so it might take me a few tries to get it in, but if I get well, there, eh, first try, I'll take it. Hey! Yeah, yeah, that's actually probably the hardest timing-wise skip. There's some amount of RNG, uh, but it's mostly predictable. There's three different cycles. It's a half a second, a second and a half, and two and a half seconds. So I got the best cycle, and uh, that saves a lot of time. Uh, here I'm also dual classing. I need to have access to pickpocketing for a lot of the runs, so I'm going to be dual classing right now to get that done. Uh, but when I dual class, I lose the ability to cast my wizard spells. We're going to fix that really soon. How many levels did you just give yourself for pickpocketing? Cool. Not that many. So here I'm using the first multiple dialogue. I use it to avoid some, uh, essentially the whole cutscene. Um, the way that it works, and I didn't get a chance to explain that earlier, but the idea behind multiple dialogue is the game is trying to unload the original dungeon from memory because I no longer have any active party members there. But Imowen starts dialogue with me before that part of the script fires. And it pulls Imowen out of the conversation because she is unloaded from the game's memory at the same time that the map is unloaded from the game's memory. Her dialogue remains in my dialogue window, and I can still continue to click it, and it's hard-coded to responses for other NPCs that are not Imowen. In this case, I used dialogue for an NPC that's not in my party, uh, which caused the conversation to end prematurely. And then I used dialogue to give 20,000 gold to that man uh, that I obviously don't have. This is, <laughs> this is getting a little intense. It's a little weird. Uh, we're going to do a little bit more with multiple dialogue here, and then we're mostly done with it. We'll do a little bit more towards the end of the game as well. But mostly it's skipping Chapter 2, which is entirely a money grind. Um, not really a whole lot of anything getting skipped that we actually want to see in the speedrun. And I'm doing it here to prevent me from having to do two fetch quests. I've also split the party because we're going to cut Yoshimo from the party here. We don't want him anymore. And we need to level up a lot right now. Turning in those two fetch quests gave me a whole lot of experience. <laughs> All right. And we also need to get rid of Yoshimo. Sorry, dude. We like you, but we're done with you now. I'm going to wait a second here for him to start pathing towards me. And once he starts walking, I need to get new spells. Um, well, uh, when you get a chance, could you, uh, if you know what your runner's choice is going to be, we do have a couple of donations for runner's choice. Oh, goodness. I actually have no idea what my runner's choice is going to be, but I will think about it. You could always do Earthbound naming the player Happy Birthday, Solomon. <laughs> I I'm going to throw Solomon a bone and not do that. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the first uh, sort of RNG gatekeeper of the run. It's uh, where a lot of time gets lost. I've actually lost in my previous playthroughs. Oh, wow. OK, well, we'll take the first one, I guess. That's pretty good. Um, I've lost up to 10 and a half minutes in this sequence. <laughs> we are going to do this in about four seconds. So what you missed there was I turned him into a squirrel, and then I put a meteor on that squirrel. Now there's no longer a squirrel, but I took all of his shoes. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Whatever you're Turn a guy into a squirrel, chuck a meteor at him, yes. and then take his shoes. That's just another day in the life, you know? It's, that's what we do. <laughs> um, I do a lot of buying and selling of stuff here. What you're seeing is, uh, what I did is I, in, bleh, I identified this wand that I got from the first dungeon. Then I sold it. When you sell it to a vendor, they recharge it to full. So it's recharged. I steal it and then sell it again. It's worth a lot more when it's recharged to full. I steal it one more time because I still need it. And then I spend the money that I just got from him to buy a couple of scrolls. And we're going on a vampire hunt. Oh. So I'm going to say a couple quick things about the vampire and then feel free to go crazy with the donations. The vampire has no death animation. When you reduce him to one hit point, a coffin on the other side of the complex becomes clickable. Uh, at that time, even though he'll see him somewhere else, I can stake him in his coffin. And uh, you can basically go ahead with your donations for now, and I'll let you know when I need to get the mic. All right, there are several. I, I do want to plug there's a couple of incentives coming up later today. There is the post-run glitch fest for Secret of Mana, any percent. That's at 511 out of 1,500. Uh, console disc cam for a Dragon Quest V uh, nothing out of 250. Uh, fighting Kulex in Super Mario RPG is at uh, just under 1,600 out of 3,500. Uh, Visit Link and Samus, Super Mario RPG is at 130 out of 750. Fighting the first demon wall of Final Fantasy XII, 235 out of 750. Fighting the Elder Worm, 120 out of 750. Uh, singing the credits has been met. We also have game choice, Star Tropics versus Star Tropics 2, which is going to be about this time tomorrow. A uh, few donations I'll try to run through. Uh, Big Steve donates $25. I'm ready to see some sidekicks in the Star Ocean run. That was to name Nell, 
B exclamation point. Uh, $5 donation from Dejumbi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Wanted to give another big shout out to Ben Epley, aka B, whose favorite game is Star Ocean 3. He also does the best wrestling, wrestling moves like the shot, which he used on Toon El Bombador. This donation is going towards naming Nell B in honor of Ben Epley. Uh, $25 from Kirby. Hey, Koal, Kirby here, don't mess up. Uh, Thanks, Kirby. Appreciate it, man. Uh, 25 from Grimora. Please decimate this game. Watch out for dragons. That goes to Runner's Choice. $50 from Klepp. Hey, Koal, good luck with the run. This donation also goes to Runner's Choice. Thanks, Klepp. Uh, and $1 from Adventure Academy. When are you making a printy percent dude, printy for life? And let me see where that's going. That is going towards leveling up Ark's Macho stat in Terra Nigna any percent. Uh, I thought that, that run must is be an now. older donation. Must yeah. be. You are nearly ready. Snuck in here, back from the dead. I'm gonna grab the mic back real quick. Uh, we basically to get caught up on the storyline here. We missed a cutscene where Imowen and this evil villain, who we don't really know anything about, uh, allowed themselves to be arrested. Well, he allowed her to be arrested essentially. Um, to take over the prison from the inside and use it for devious experiments. But it's a hidden prison, and we needed to charter a vessel and hire the Shadow Thieves to find out where this prison even is. So now we're going to get into the prison, and the sort of gate warden is the pirate captain that is the leader of this town. And uh, I'm bribing his doorman to let me into his house, and then I'm going to tell him that I want in. And he takes me in. Aww. So ordinarily, if you talk to him, he wants to hit you with a scimitar more than he wants to let you in here, so... Um, that's what the 18 Charisma is for. It's literally the only thing we use it for in the entire run. <laughs> to be really persuasive, it's like, I think I need to go to jail now. Yeah, that's literally all it is. So this is, uh, getting back to the familiar skip, I did this really early in the run to get through that one locked door. We're doing it again here. Um, uh, gonna need to use one more charge on the wand, it looks like. That's kind of a bummer, but that's all right. There we go, that should do. So what's happening here is it tries to put me in the next valid location, and it's not going to be able to get me into any of these places that are already occupied. So instead, it allows me to shove a bear through a keyhole. <laughs> yes. That bear. Clap for the bear. Yeah. Well, we're going to do it again. So if you really like bears, oh, congratulations. I um, but yeah, so one of the weird things about the way that the game is scripted is one of the skips that we've done earlier, and I'm not uh, even familiar with which skip it is, uh, prevents the part of the script from firing that unpolymorphs the bear. It's supposed to have a duration, but this bear will be a bear forever. Oh. Things go well up. And uh, we're going to have another probably 30 seconds here. If you have anything you want to read off, now's probably the time. I am pleased. My revenge will soon come. I do not currently have any donations. Nothing's come in. Uh, have you had a chance to think more about where you might want yes, Runner's Choice to go? Because there uh, are still a couple uh, donations waiting there. Yeah, I'll probably have to take a look and see what's on the tracker for that. Um, but I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, I've got a couple things I can say here, actually, while we're watching the cutscene. The first thing is uh, we're going to be talking to a Duergar merchant right away as soon as we get down to the Undark. And he's got two item lists. One of the very first things that was patched out of this game after release is to correct that merchant. Uh, it's supposed to be that his premium item list is only offered to Drow, and the idea is we're supposed to get disgusted as Drow and come back to him. Uh, but for whatever reason, on the first release of the game, the first time you ever talk to him, he always offers you the premium items, which is something we're going to be taking advantage of because he has two very important scrolls for the end of the game. And my haste has worn off, so let's fix that. So that merchant is right down here. And we need to steal from him. Uh, and we're not going to use these for a while. We're getting Tensor's Transformation, and we are getting Limited Wish. And there's one more thing I need from him that's not on his premium list. It's on his regular list, and that's this True Sight Scroll. I do have one quick $20 donation from Kimbo. It says, hashtag Team Koal, heart and evil spirit. Thanks, Kimbo. Uh, it does not look like the, this donation has gone towards anything in particular. So if you would like to put that towards something, please let us know. Uh, if you are putting this towards runner's choice, please also let us know of that, uh, and we'll take care of that. Thank you. So, so is there any risk when you're stealing all those items? Uh, not especially. There's a little bit of risk with the guy I just pickpocketed. So basically what's going on down here in the Underdark is this cave is too dark to enter, and that gnome is the mayor of a gnome town who has a sun gem that allows us to enter this cave. Uh, we're supposed to do a side quest for him and help out the town, and then he gives me the gem as a reward. We don't have time for that, so I just steal it from him. <laughs> 
Uh, there's an ambush party spawning just off the bottom of my screen here. It only spawns probably 80% of the time. It seems completely random. I think it has something to do with processor speed more than any specific triggers. And uh, here I'm setting up the final instance of the multiple dialogue glitch using this dragon. The dragon wants to disguise us as drow to get us into the drow city to steal back her dragon eggs and return them to her. Uh, but we're evil and we also don't care about that. So we're even going to use her dialogue in an even more evil way. Which is going to be to glitch this game done. even more. You now resemble the so she's really crowd. weird because we don't actually have a numerical response to click for her. But whenever there's no response, clicking the space underneath the dialogue advances the text as though you picked option number one. And it happens to be that the two times we need multiple dialogue for the rest of the run, it's going to be uh, clicking option number one anyway. So she doesn't realize it yet, but not only am I not going to help her, but she's going to help me in a lot of ways on the surface. <laughs> So here, because I look like a drow, I can bribe this guy and go right out the front door, and that's the entire Underdark sequence. There's a lot going on up here. We don't want to deal with any of it. What we do want to do is change our spells around, and this is unfortunately the scariest part of the run for me. There are two cutscene skips going on here, and if I miss either one of them, I lose about a minute and a half. So I'm going to be milking the pause button a little bit here. Got it. So normally what happens is the advisors get spawned and he does this super long dialogue and in addition to being super long It also stretches out the text on my dialogue box so much that this multiple dialogue glitch that I've set up Will scroll all the way off the top and I won't be able to use it anymore And I need to preserve it for the black dragon in the next area So if I don't talk lock those guys before they start the cutscene and I should explain talk lock momentarily as well um, they will actually have this super long dialogue and force me to screw up the cutscene skip and all this other stuff. And I also just use multiple dialogue to skip having to go find Bodai and the Ren Lanthorns. People who played this before know you're supposed to go fight some vampires. Turns out that the Silver Dragon is going to help me skip that too. So the talk locking that I mentioned earlier is a pretty well-known glitch in this run. And that is that if you click to talk on somebody, they actually wait the full duration of a combat round to react to anything that you do because uh, they're expecting you to start a conversation. So I used that earlier when I was casting Polymorph Other on that guy in the Thieves' Warehouse there, and uh, that's actually how you do it without him aggroing to you. Uh. So here it's a puzzle box that gives us one of the quest items we need to advance the plot, and there's three things we're trying to collect while we're here in Sultan SLR. We need to get three artifacts to summon the Avatar of Rillafane, which is sort of like an elven demigod protector spirit guardian type thing, and he's going to kill all the bad guys here for us. That's going to be super helpful. Here I'm using the last use of multiple dialogue in the run. This is to get uh, dialogue for a bribery option. Normally it requires 30,000 gold. You can see it currently I have uh, zero. So maybe not so much. <laughs> and he's also uh, not smart enough to take the items that I've dropped on the floor. So even though he's supposed to take all of my money and all of my items, he uh, didn't. So thanks, <laughs> Dragon. Do you help anybody in this run? Oh, certainly not. <laughs> Yeah, you are lawful evil. Yeah, you remember I rolled evil. I mean, that's that's what we're all about. So, I actually no, I help uh, I help someone in this run. I help Nami during this run. Oh yay! And I do have one ten dollar donation from Fizu. Who says good luck, Koal. In my heart, this protagonist remains beardy. Also, Mine hey Brosentia, what was Loki's excuse when he turned up the party long after it started? Uh, tell me, what was his excuse? Baldur's late too. Oh, <laughs> that, that that sounds like a bad improv scene. Yeah, I, I give that one like a C plus. <laughs> At least you tried. It's okay. I like you, Faizu. <laughs> and I appreciate the avatar. It's too bad we didn't get a chance to use it. Oh yeah, we made an avatar in case it was beardy, but that's okay. Purple. Lady Face is kicking some major booty here. Yeah, this is actually going really well. Purple Lady Face has some very good RNG today. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that happened a moment ago that I should explain is uh, I used Limited Wish there. Limited Wish spawns a genie that asks you what you want to wish for, and it's why I have a Wisdom of Six. It allows me to wish for the shape change spell effect. Uh, it lasts about 20 seconds longer than the game. Uh, so in this case, if I make 20 seconds worth of mistakes, it might fall off before the run is over, and if that's the case, I need to revert to an earlier save. Uh, so in previous runs, I've used pause to try and make sure that I don't run out of time. Uh, generally speaking, I've been avoiding doing that lately, so we'll see if I can play it a little riskier here. It also allowed me to interrupt the cutscene that was playing inside of that house, so instead of having to wait 30 seconds for the two of them to kill each other, I just pickpocketed the good guy and walked out. Good plan. Stealing things from good guys is a recurring theme in this run. <laughs> 
So I collected a harp and a horn, and I need those to give to these statues to drain the water out of the staircase, the physics of which I don't really understand uh, because we're draining the water out, and then there's stairs here that look like they sort of go down-ish, but I'm going to an area that certainly looks like I'm going up Wait, instead. Um, normally I can skip her dialogue, but oh well. So it's kind of weird. I don't really understand how those stairs work, but eh, whatever. So here I use Shape Change for the first time, and it's to transform into a Mind Flayer. And being a Mind Flayer is uh, the easiest way to complete the finale of the game, because Mind Flayers can deal damage to the Intelligence stat. And if your stat gets reduced to zero, it doesn't matter what stat it is, you just die. So these guys have about 160 hit points. They have about six Intelligence. So being a Mind Flayer kills them way faster than whittling down all their hit points. And also I cast a spell called Tensor's Transformation. And in AD&D, Tensor's Transformation was a spell that gave wizards essentially fighter stats. So right now Ooh. I have fighter stats and I'm a Mind Flayer, and I'm just eating the brains of Corrupted Elementals. Yes, finish it quickly! <laughs> I feel the tree of life dying! John is drawing too close to his goal. John, she got John. really excited about that part. Oh, yeah. So here I give a little brief delay because sometimes there's some funny stuff that happens with the script that starts this fight. Um, we actually have to beat this boss by running off screen before he casts his spell protections. The AI is not smart enough to cast them while we're off screen. But for some reason, sometimes during this little animation here, he'll cast it anyway. So we need to make sure that I have a quick save lined up in case that happens. It didn't happen this time, so we're good. And I'm using what's called the quick slot item glitch here. And basically the idea is that in casting a spell, one of the very last parts of the script is to remove the scroll from your inventory. And as long as I keep moving it around, I can cast it indefinitely. If I leave it in one spot long enough, eventually the script catches up and removes it. But in this case, three castings is enough to kill him off screen and send us to the final chapter. <laughs> so that was your epic uh, quote unquote final battle. Here I want to turn back into a human because Mind Flayers can't, bleh, can't normally cast spells. Uh, they can use scrolls, but they can't normally cast spells. Get a little dialogue here with myself. And I'm going to refresh haste at this time. So I drank an oil of speed earlier. Oil of speed works just like haste for the uh, purposes of... Wrong spell. Whatever. Uh, for the purposes of increasing your movement rate. But it also lasts a lot longer. So we're supposed to be doing these trials to master the self. I'm only going to do one of them, and I'm going to do the fear trial, because I cast a spell just now called Remove Fear, and it makes me immune to fear. So thanks for that trial. I guess I mastered the self. We're in pretty good shape now. <laughs> I, I feel like you have. I feel pretty solid about my ability to feel fear. Good. So just like before with dropping my stuff on the ground for the Black Dragon, I can actually use the same quest item here four times to set up the final battle. And I've got some scrolls to read, starting with this one here. This is True Sight. True Sight penetrates illusion magic. I also really want haste, because if it wears off during this fight, I am just dead. And I want to be a Mind Flayer again, because even though the antagonist has a pretty monstrous intelligence score, uh, it's still a lot faster than chewing through his hit points. So here he's going to transform into the avatar of the dead god of murder, cast a bunch of spell protections, and summon four of the giant most awesome demons he can find. Uh, they are all melee bruisers, every single one of them, and I am really fast. So I'm just going to run away from them. See you guys later. <laughs> and uh, he just had his spell protection fall off because of my true sight spell. Gets rid of the mislead. We made a little copy of him right over here. And uh, get ready on time. It's whenever time stop wears off. Time. Holy cow. That's, uh, that's not too bad. That's like 30 seconds off my PB. <laughs> 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 so that was Baldur's Gate 2 Enhanced Edition. Uh, a lot of what was going on there is essentially all of his spell protections and all of his AC and everything don't really matter under the effects of time stop. So I get to hit him four times under time stop and he just dies. His intelligence goes to zero and he's just gone. So how fast would you normally expect to play like casually a playthrough of Baldur's Gate 2? 100 hours. <laughs> well, without a doubt, I could spend 80 hours in chapter two. Okay, that's Easily. good to know. I think anybody who played this as a kid probably spent 80 hours in Chapter 2. How long did you spend in Chapter 2 on this one? Uh, I didn't actually have Chapter 2 in this one. <laughs>
<laughs> I am, uh, I'm monstrously underestimate. Do you guys want to have like the final cinematic play or something? Yep. Oh, uh, for Glitchless, it's actually not that bad. Probably about an hour. Um, there was somebody who was working on it on the forums a couple of years ago, and I didn't ever see him finish the run, but it was uh, estimated to be about an hour, maybe like 10, or minute, 10 minutes, give or take. Huh. Um, and a lot of it is because Chapter 2 is a money grind, and so the fastest way to get 20,000 gold still takes like 20 minutes. Yeah, I'd say, are, are we still behind time? If we're still I, behind time, we might want to start I trying think, to think I up. think that we are a little behind, so... Um that we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Cool. I'll just uh, give a few plugs and then I'll, we'll turn it over to the next host and next game. So coming up next is Star Ocean Till the End of Time run by Ithere, followed by Mother One, the Earthbound Beginnings version by Skateman222, and then Secret of Mana Any Percent Co-op by Yagamath, Bowie the Hero, and Stinger PA. Um, just as a quick reminder, this is RPG Limit Break 2017, supporting the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI. They advocate and educate, lead, and most importantly, listen. If you need to reach out, please head to NAMI.org or use the hashtag StigmaFree on Twitter or tweet directly to them with at NAMI Communicate. Uh, this concludes this run. Uh, we'll, ha we'll cut to a commercial break here, and uh, we'll have a new host with uh, Star Ocean 3. This has been Drifting Skies. Uh, hope you had a good day, and hope you will continue to have a good day. <laughs>